in a world where everyone knows everything. <laughs> yeah, right. One dad stands below everyone and yells, I know nothing. Please welcome. Please welcome. This is the Dad Who Knows Nothing podcast. Well, welcome everybody. This is the Dad Who Knows Nothing podcast. Very excited today to have Kevin Keppel with us. He is the owner of Keppel Coaching. He is a trans formative, transformational business coach. And he specializes in working with business owners and executives to help them create clarity in their business, massive impact with their leadership and freedom in their lives. And I think anybody who listens to this podcast would raise their hand and say, yeah, I'd like, I'd like a couple of those things, maybe just one, but uh, Kevin helps you get all three. So Kevin, thanks for joining us today uh, to talk a little bit about uh, the journey and what you're, what you're doing for your client. Yeah, it's my pleasure. I'm excited to be here to uh, learn with you. All right. So, Kevin, you know, we were talking before we started recording. We're roughly the same age. I'm always fascinated about journeys, how people get to where they're where they're at and in their career, in their life. So walk me through what got you into coaching and what brought you to doing this for your clients today to focusing on that leadership coaching and how to do that while still being able to kind of have balance and freedom in their own lives. Yeah. Uh, you know, it was, uh, it was really easy. I knew exactly what I wanted to do from the time I was born and it just all worked out perfectly. Um, huh. said no, right. said no one ever. Right. <laughs> um, so yeah, it was, um, like you said, kind of in the green room before we got started, we were talking about just the ups and downs and, you know, corkscrews that life goes through. And, you know, I really spent most of my twenties working in hospitality and I had a lot of fun and it was really uh, not conducive to the life I wanted to create though. It wasn't very stable. I was out late, you know, nights, worked all the time and, you know, I knew I wanted more out of life. And so, uh, just transferred into uh, professional sales in my late twenties and working in sales is really great because you, know, you get to create your paycheck and, you know, um, it's hard for me to work for a, you know, one specific number because I know no matter how much I show up, that's what I'm going to get. And I love sales because I really got to help people get what they want. And, um, you know, I worked at enterprise software sales for a number of years, and then I ended up working in financial services sales. And, you know, we were talking a little bit about that and I was having a lot of success. You know, you, you have success in that industry, you win trips. And you know, I was like, winning the trips and I got promoted to director of sales. Cause if you're good at the job, you get promoted. Right. And then you should be in charge of people. And I really liked that because not being in charge necessarily, but I really like getting to empower and inspire the people behind me. And I was finding so much like joy in that. And it felt so good. But I couldn't figure out why the rest of the job wasn't like just, it didn't light me up. There was no passion in it. There was at first when it was new. And, but once I kind of like, you know, quote unquote, figured it out, I never like figured it out completely, of course. But I started getting kind of these diminishing returns and I, I would work harder and I was getting less. And, you know, I got a pretty big check once and I just found like that there was not one thing I wanted. I was like, dude, if this was $2 million, I don't think this would bring me any, you know, level of happiness, aliveness, or connectedness. And if I'm disconnected and unhappy, what's the point? You know, like you can have all the money in the world, but if you're unhappy, you're unhappy. You know, no amount of money is going to change that. And I was working with a business coach at the time and he was a pretty funny guy. He was uh, in the secret service for almost 30 years. And like those guys are very good at stoically standing still and making you uncomfortable. Uh, I've learned and I'm sure you've seen him on TV. Like, and he just look at me and I would talk and I would keep talking and I'd talk some more. I'm like, hey, you should be an interrogator. He's like, yeah, I used to be. Mm -hmm. And uh, like, <laughs> It was so good at getting you to tell the truth quickly. Not that, I, you know, you're trying to lie, but um, I was just ah, talking about yourself is sometimes a little sticky, especially, you know, when you're a little younger. And uh, he's like, dude, tell me what you really love about your job. And I said, I love this. I love that. And da, 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 da. he goes, dude, I don't even think you like your job. Stop. And what are you talking about? He's like, you don't even look me in the eye when you're talking. You're kind of like slumped down in your chair. Your tone got really soft. And I just... I don't feel like you're telling yourself the truth. And, you know, what I really liked was helping and mentoring people and empowering and inspiring the people behind me, helping them be more without making them feel like less. And my coach basically said to me, he's like, you should be a coach. And long story short, that's what I decided to do. I found a job with a, um, a billion dollar company based in Dallas where I live and was a national sales coach and leadership trainer for them for a number of years. And I got really good at, uh, you know, helping people just step all the way into their genius and using that to serve. And so 
years ago, I stepped over, started doing my own thing. And uh, now that's what I get to do every day. I get to help you know people with growth and giving. That's the whole point, right? Grow as much as we can so we can give it all away. And, you know, it's, it's a pretty, pretty uh, profound way to get to go through life when you get to, you know, create the way you want to create with who you want to create with. So I'm really, really grateful that that's what I get to do now. Nice. And you, you talked about that uh, connect with their genius. Um, I've heard that phrase before. What, what does that mean? And what, what can you clarify? Can you expound on that a little bit? Sure. And, you know, like, I don't think like genius isn't rare. It's just people who understand how to use their genius on demand. That's kind of rare. It's like, you know, like talent's not rare. Everybody has talent. But people who actually understand how to, those talents are their strengths and how they can use that whenever they want. And also what it looks like when it completely gets in their way, because that's our natural sources of power. And really, you know, what we do, I mean, it's pretty simple. There's four zones we kind of walk people through and we take them through the that mindset, heart set, coherence. You know, because so many people just get trapped in their mind and that's all they use to process. But the mind's finite. It has a beginning, it has an end. And so, you you know, you know what you know, but that's it. There's no, you know, creativity in that. And so we spend the next, you know, block of time and creativity really helping people understand how to express, you know, their unique version of genius into the world, whatever that may look like. And, you know, when you really get people, you know, lined up coherently creating in the way the only they can, that's when peak performance and peak experiences or flow start coming into life. And, you know, flows like when we get those like profound insights that are like life changing and we get this elite performance and we just feel really good and really the last part of what we do is helping people understand influence, you know, like influencing themselves and influencing other people because I can't give what I don't have. If I don't know how to influence my own behavior, I definitely don't know how to influence yours. And so helping people really understand, you know, what they are and the contrast of what they aren't. I used to try to be good at everything. Obviously nobody's good at everything. I found myself doing a lot of things that I really didn't like doing. Like I should not be coding a website ever. I should barely even be on a website. You know, I'm like, <laughs> The opposite of functional with technical skills. But, you know, I would try to do everything because, you know, I see somebody who was good at something, I would compare myself to them. But one of the tools that I love to use is Gallup's Strength Finders, or it's called Clifton Strengths Assessment now. But it's um, a really cool assessment because it highlights your natural talents, right? And it's not a complete portrait of your character, but it's like, hey, here's your natural talents. And if you develop these, these are your literal superpowers. And more importantly, here's what it looks like when these completely go against you and give away all your power. And it's so nice to have statistical data and Gallup's really great at data. You know, they've done that assessment 30 plus million times now. And, you know, like the natural talent we all have is we're naturally talented left-handed or right-handed. I happen to be left-handed and, you know, I learned how to write with my left hand and, you know, that's kind of where the learning stopped at, you know, however old we are when we learned to write. And, you know, for the past three decades, my writing has evolved very little that's okay. I'm not, you know, getting paid for my handwriting. Uh, luckily I'd be really hungry. Uh, but you know, we do have these talents that we do need to constantly develop and we need to make new decisions about who we are and how we want to show up in the world and how we can show up in the world and constantly just going out into the unknown. But you know, that's what is one of the big limiting beliefs that so many people have myself included in the past that the unknown is scary, but if you're not going into the unknown, you're not creating, you're not using your genius. You're just repeating something you've seen. Yeah, and I think that's because there's a there's a fundamental uh, fear of what's going to be there, and, and and you know we're influencing ourselves to think of that as something that is scary instead of something that's potentially opening uh, a different uh, another door or a different way of of doing things. Yeah, I think that 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 word scary gets so many people derailed. Like, okay, is it scary or is it dangerous? You know, those aren't the same thing. You know, like we get scared watching a scary movie, but you're not really in danger. I mean, right. you could, you could have a heart attack, but you know, that's probably not going to happen to most of us, but you know, like you drive your car around, that's fairly dangerous. But I mean, are you ever really scared? I mean, unless, you know, somebody else is driving who's erratic, <laughs> but you know, it's like, man, if you're not going to, you shouldn't be scared of the unknown. You should be scared of not going into the unknown because you're going to create, you know, that groundhog day, except it's not going to be fun. Like it was for Bill Murray in the movie. And you're going to get kind of the same situations, the same people. Like, why does this keep happening to me? Like, because you're refusing to change. You're clinging to this known life that you, you might not even want in spite of what you do want over here in the unknown. So when you talked about the superpowers that you can kind of identify and it becomes that superpower, is that 
is that uh, aligning them with their hero? I, I know I've seen that in some of your information as well. Aligning them with their hero inside, is that tapping into those superpowers and being able to leverage those? Yeah, you know, I like the hero's code is basically, you know, what does my elite performance look like? And what does my genius look like? How can I do that you know, on demand? And how can I do that in, you know, the most, you know, unique way I can, because that means I'm owning my truth. And, you know, we all have a very specific, you know, skill set, right? Like Liam Neeson, right? And Taken, a very specific skill set. But uh, I think that it's the comparison game that gets so many people sidetracked. They look at, you know, brother, mother, social media, whatever, TV, like I should be like that. And then the shoulds start happening. Mm -hmm. like, no, like if you're truly creating, there's no example of what you're doing. And there's like a, when it comes to Gallup strength finders, you know, there's 34 of them listed. It's always the same 34, just a different order. And like, you know, again, I've never seen a blank one. Nobody doesn't have talent. But the likelihood that two people would have the same top five in the same order is like in the like 20 or 30 million. And so like we're, we all know we're different, but how often do we actually own that? And like, you know, your hero's code is going to be like, you know, when you're completely dialed into your gifts and you've totally, you know, detached from the outcome and you haven't created any expectations of where you're going and you're just living in flow. And, you know, flow is like, maybe overused now, I don't know, but there's lots of different types of flow, but, you know, in the first book on flow, flow by, you know, Csikszentmihalyi, greatest name, uh, he, he talks about the happiest people on earth are the people who have the most flow. You know, we're, we're biologically des designed, you know, for evolution purposes to find flow as much as we possibly can. And flow feels really good as an individual or, you know, when you're with one other person or in a group. And like, you know, you're, you can get into flow for, you know, micro flow for an instant, or you can do macro flow for days or weeks at a time. And when things are just easy and just because it hasn't been, doesn't mean it can't be. But when you really understand how to dial into your, you know, unique heroes code like that, you know, that allows you to really make new decisions of what's possible for you and, you know, your work. Yeah, no, that's, that's all great, great points. And, and I think, you know, I think it's, it's a pretty good segue into talking about it from a leadership perspective, because, you know, I think, I think internally we can all be leaders of ourselves, right? We can influence our own thinking. We can uh, maximize those talents. As you mentioned, we can constantly be striving to grow as individuals. That to me is leading. But when you talk about leaders, you know, and leadership roles in corporations and you work, you know, with a lot of leaders from probably all types of uh, backgrounds. What's the number one thing when you're talking about a manager versus a leader? What, what, what do you think is the biggest differentiator between those two? Yeah, well, I think a manager is a position and leader is more of a behavior. You know, leadership's a behavior and action, right? We don't get to call ourselves leaders. Like, I don't get to tell you that I'm funny, right? If I'm telling you jokes and you're not laughing, then I'm not that funny. I'll just see my wife for more details on that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, I think with leadership, like the number one way you know that you're managing is if you're telling people what to do. You know, John Maxwell is one of the greatest leadership you know, experts out there, right? Leadership is influence. And, you know, his book, Five Levels of Leadership, like he's such a uh, prolific writer like that he keeps it really simple. And that shows he has a deep understanding. It's like level one of leadership, like not being the highest level, level five is the highest in his uh pyramid or whatever he calls it but level one is like where you're just managing by position i'm the manager so i'm going to tell you what to do mm. that's that's managing but leadership is inspiring and empowering if you inspire me right you stimulate me to action if you empower me you give me the knowledge of what to do with that stimulation and i think that uh you know like myself included when i was first put in a leadership position in my 20s like my model of leadership was uh, very violent. He yelled a lot and screamed and he just wasn't in a happy place. And I'm like, uh, is that, I, I, I mean, I'd have had coaches and stuff like that. I had leaders around me, but this was like the first professional leader. And like the way that I got people to do what you know, I needed them to do. Like, I'd be like, Hey, um, to protect his name, I'll change it. Let's say his name was Carl. But I'm like, Hey, Carl's coming back in a little bit. And if you don't do this, like you're next, you know? And like, that is not leading that's intimidation. Right. So that's obviously not conducive to, you know, creating trust for the people that you lead, which is, you know, imperative. Yeah. You talk about influence, obviously influence, you know, leads to 
culture, it all has an impact on that. I think, I think as leaders, the thing that most leaders would say that they, you know, that would move their whatever team or operation that they're leading is <clears throat> it's not so much you know, getting, getting those high performers to, to perform even better. Right. Because we know that there's, there's only so much that an individual can do, even a, even a high performer, but it, you know, and I've often said this, if I could get, you know, my lowest performers to just get to an even or an average, um, that's a win, but how do you, how do you transform average into exceptional? How, how do you do that as a leader? Man, that was such a great point you just made. I hope uh, anybody who's listening really captured that because, you know, everybody is going to be different and everybody has capacity, right? Like, you know, there's only so much we can give. Um, I love Urban Meyer's book, Above the Line. It's a super simple book on leadership. One of my friends went to Ohio State, and so he made sure I had a copy of that. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like loosely based after they won their national championship year, kind of the way he tells the story. But he talks about kind of the percentages he works with on his team. He's like, you know, I have like that top 10%, the superstars. He's like, I don't really spend a lot of time with them unless they ask me for specific things. He's like, they're going to perform at really high levels. They don't need much, but maybe a tiny tweak here and there. And he's like, then I've got the bottom 10%. He's like, really, no matter what I do, they're not going to do that much. And they're going to take a lot of my energy though. And he's like, I spend most of my time. He's like, there's a bottom middle and a top middle. He goes, the bottom middle, I can usually move to the top middle and the top middle every now and then I can move them into the top 10%. And so that's where I spend a lot of my time is, you know, with the middles, the bottom and the top so that, you know, I get the most bang for my buck, so to speak. And I think it's, you know, inten intention, right? Uh, are you intentional with where you're spending your time? And, you know, like that word influence, like that's such a great word. Like, you know, if you're influencing the behavior either positively or negatively. And I think that there's a pretty simple equation that we can all work, you know, and le again, leadership is a behavior. You don't need a team to be a leader, but the influence equation, if you will, it's trust, connection, and vision. And, you know, especially young leaders, they're going to start in the back, right? Like, here's the vision, like, here's where we're going, go get it. And, you know, if people don't feel connected to it, if they don't trust you, like, it's not going to be as powerful as it could be. But when people really trust you, that means they feel safe. And if they feel safe, that means they'll be vulnerable and they'll create and, you know, if they feel like they're connected to you, then they'll be connected to the vision that you have. And then they'll co-create that vision with you. And, you know, we had talked a little bit about uh, 49ers earlier and Bill Walsh is, you know, a great coach, even though he coached for the wrong team, right? He should have mm -hmm. been with the Cowboys, but that's okay. Uh, but, you know, he has this great quote. He's like, you know, the way that you create championships is when you have your team, people are growing as individuals and they grow together as a team. Like, that's how you create championships. And you know, that's such a powerful statement. And I think a lot of people miss that just by, you know, starting with the vision. Yeah. And that, and that vision nowadays has to be, it, it, there has to be more of a focus on being inclusive, that vision, so that everyone feels like they can be a part of it. So it's even more critical today to have, to be able to connect with people as a leader, you know, with that vision. I think I was reading somewhere where it, it actually quantified the amount of times that a CEO would have to express his vision before it started, you know, really permeating into the company at, at all the different levels. And it was an astronomical amount of time. And so one of the things that uh, I talked about in the last podcast I recorded was, you know, how do you change that story? How do you make it really connect with people? that may be from different backgrounds. So you're in a different location, you're in a different conference hall, you know, conference, you know, place with a different location within your company. And you're trying to say the same vision, you can't just say the same words and do it 50 times at 50 different locations, you have to do it in a way that connects to people. So how do you how do you feel that leaders can do that to connect that vision with their people? And that's such a powerful observation because you know one size fits all definitely doesn't work and i think as a leader you know you've got to really of course have a vision because if you don't have a vision or a target you know then how would you know if you got it or how do you know what action to take to go get it but you know how does you know you have this company vision or for your team or whatever and so the way that you know you motivate the people the people whoever the people may be right is by showing them how 
you know, this worker on the team, this team member, how them supporting the overall vision helps them get whatever they want, right? But if I don't know what their individual vision is or their individual desires, then I can't really speak to that. But, you know, how does you helping me get what I want get you what you want? And it's about purpose. And, and you don't need to make it complicated. It's two simple questions. Like, what do you want? Why do you want it? And then ask people that. And, you know, like if people can't explain something to you simply, then they don't understand it. And that doesn't make people bad. Like if you would asked me that question up until I was 30, I would have looked at you like, uh, what do you mean? Like, what do I want? What do I want to eat? Or what do you mean? And I just had never really spent that much in, <laughs> intentional time thinking about it. But, you know, what do you want? That's your passion. What are you passionate about creating in your life, in your business, in your career right now? And then, you know, the why is like, how do you mix generosity into that passion, right? That's your purpose. And that's really beautiful, but you know, you got to be really careful with that too. It's like, don't add in the third question, the how, right? Cause that's ego, right? Like how is like, you know, the ego demands to know, right? If it doesn't know, it thinks it should know. And so it's like, what do you want? Why do you want it? Yeah, no, that's a great, great point. And sometimes it's just asking those follow-up whys and keep trying to drilling down to, to, to get to the core uh, thing that they're looking for. Cause you're right. Sometimes people have never been asked that directly. And, and so you got to spend time with them to understand what, what makes them tick. Uh, I had quite a few opportunities where I wasn't the direct manager or leader of, of a lot of people that I had to influence. And that was, was one of the things that I found successful is just getting to know them as a person, getting to know what their pain points were for whatever role that they're doing, what they're looking to get out of, and then if you can attach that to whatever strategy you're working on, then you got that connection and hopefully you can keep, you know, building on that. And, and that's the bridge to influencing them to uh, help you with whatever you're trying to accomplish. Right. Because, you know, you need buy their buy in. Yeah. Well, I mean, people are always asking kind of three questions, right. Of the leader internally. It's like, number one, do you like me? I feel like the leader doesn't like me. Like I definitely don't feel safe. Right. And then like, can, can, can I trust you? Like, you know, are you, are you authentic? Are you, you know, showing up as who you say you are? And the last question, like, can you help me get what I want? You know, like, is what's yeah. important to me important to you? And like our actions are going to really answer those positively or negatively. Yeah, no doubt. So I do want to ask one, you know, we've talked about a lot of things that leaders can do to help, you know, with vision to help. Okay. Uh, what's the differentiator? But what's the worst thing you can do as a leader? I mean, the worst thing you can probably do is make it all about you and really, you know, just attempting to be right instead of kind, because I've never walked away from a leader who's right about everything and felt good about myself or felt good about them. But I've walked away from a leader who was really kind, especially like down the road when I realized that I was completely wrong about something, but they were just being graceful with me. And, you know, they didn't use that sort of truth that we have and chop me off at the knees. Maybe they just pointed a little bit with it. And you know, that's the power of questions, right? It's like really, really beautiful when you have somebody who's graceful and delicate, that just doesn't need to be right. That just wants to be present with you. And so, you know, as a leader, if, you know, being right is more important to you than getting what you want, like there's a huge disconnect right there. Yeah, absolutely. So many strong leaders that I've, that have impacted me and I've, have heard that, you know, of others that have impacted other people. They've all said something similar to the fact of, you know, when I talked with that individual, he made me feel like I was the only person in the room. And that setting could have been a bunch of people. And he, you know, he was just asking questions from different individuals and they had a chance to ask a question. And that leader was able to make them feel like they were heard. And I think that gets into the inclusion piece that gets into diversity and all the stuff that is so important and so critical today. And it's, it's really just from a behavior that's being modeled by an individual that's saying, it's not about me, it's about you. And yeah, I may be in this position, but I, I'm taking feedback that I receive because I don't know all the answers, but we're going to work together to find the answers. I mean, you, you said such a great statement, feeling heard. Like, that's all we want as humans. Like, you don't even have to agree with me, just hear me. It's like, yep. we've all, you know, had something happen to us, like, you know, at, with the travel, airport, hotel, whatever, where, you know, something bad maybe happened to us. And like, I was at a hotel in Oregon once and like, and I was sleeping and somebody came in my room in the middle of the night 
luckily like the latch was on it but it's like boom, 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 right. it's really loud yeah. and I'm like that was a little weird you know and I was just explaining it to the person at the desk the next day and they wouldn't stop they wouldn't let me finish I was just let me finish. I wasn't even upset I was just like hey what if I was you know a, a woman and that door wasn't locked or you know or me and it wasn't locked you know and something bad happened this is really dangerous it's a big deal and I just wouldn't even listen to me. It's like, no, we'll give you a free room. And I don't want anything. I'm just like, just hear me. That's all I wanted. And I was right. so frustrated because yeah. like, I wasn't frustrated when I walked up there, but the fact that they just wouldn't listen to me, I felt, I didn't feel very valued. And, you know, like in a professional setting, like, man, like your best asset is the people, like you should cherish them and, you know, value them. And all you have to do is create a space. Like you said, it could be in a crowd. It could be one-on-one, whatever, just show up for people and be present. What a gift to give somebody. Yeah. I wanted to ask you, Kevin, what in the last few years, obviously coming out of this pandemic, things are starting to get back to normal. What kind of shifts have you seen in what leaders are looking for from someone like you, as opposed to maybe before this whole crazy storm of a worldwide pandemic happened? Have you seen big shifts in what they're focused on, what they what they want? Are there specific problems that maybe you're seeing more? Yeah, you know, really, I've seen a huge shift in focus from people, you know, when they come to me, a lot of times it's to work on themselves, of course, but it's more in like working on themselves so they can connect with people and build better relationships with the people that they lead. Because people now more than ever are really picky, so to speak, for lack of a better term, about where they work and who they work for. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of the leaders like have you know, gotten to where they are because they're really good at doing what they do, but maybe... You know, they're, they're great leaders too, but they're like, how can I be even better? Because if I can, you know, maximize the people behind me, then that's the whole point, right? Is, you know, creating more for the people behind us and, you know, on and on and on. Cause then you're a really great model of behavior because, you know, the highest level of leadership is when you're a leader that's creating other leaders who create other leaders, but, you know, can't give what you don't have, right? If I don't have the skills, I can't give them to you. Yeah, that's such a great point. And, and I'm and I'm glad to see that you're seeing that trend because it 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 bodes well for leadership across across all industries. If if more and more leaders are taking that opportunity to grow themselves and shift kind of where they're looking at and what they're trying to focus on learning and what areas of leadership they may need to shore up, right? Maybe they're very good strategy wise. They're very good formulating a strategy. They're very good at talking to the board and getting all these things, you know, and doing all the things that you look at as an executive leader. But they, if, if everybody's leaving their company and the operation because they don't feel heard, they don't feel appreciated. And there's somebody else down the road that can give them what they want from that standpoint, then you're really just leading a sinking ship and you know, you got to shore that up to make sure that um, with the way the employee market is, uh, you know, I don't know that it will change anytime soon that there won't continue to be that movement. And so I think companies are understanding and leaders are understanding how valuable sustained excellence from staff is. is. And so let's invest there, make sure that they all feel like they're being developed and being supported. Yeah, I mean, it, it's so expensive to have turnover. You know, like what's what's the cost of one employee coming in and leaving? I mean, there's so much that goes into that. And you know, like, man, there are so many amazing people out there just, you know, waiting for somebody to really like like we've talked about, just see them, let them feel heard and let them, you know, use whatever their genius is. And you know, a lot of people have made these choices because they've been told by other leaders that, you know, you know, you're this. Like, okay, cool. But, you know, where's, where can we make a new decision? Because, you know, let, like Steve Jobs, right? Like, I think I heard you say this actually on a podcast recently. It's like, we don't hire smart people so we can tell them what to do. We hire them so they can tell us what to do. Like, man, that's pretty brilliant, Steve Jobs. No wonder you created such a good company. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so another question for you is, you know, in line with, I, 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 always, I always throw the insurance industry in there as an example, because that's where I am. I didn't expect to be in the insurance industry for, you know, 18 years going on, you know, continuing on. When I came out, you know, of school, I wasn't expecting this to be the industry where I ended up. What do you think makes employers or leaders, what do you think they can do to appeal to more people on these types of industries that maybe 
you know, nobody's going to, nobody's going to university. Oh yeah. I'm going to go to Harvard to learn about in, insurance so that I can be, you know, work in the insurance industry. Right. So there's, there's all these other lines of work that people are interested in and are very excited about. <clears throat> and not that people aren't excited about insurance. There are, you know, I'm excited about aspects of insurance. This is not about that, but I don't think that a lot of people grow up when they're five years old and like, I want to be in the insurance industry. So how do you appeal to people to, to potentially go down that path that, you know, that I made that said, Hey, you know what, this is a pretty good industry. There's a lot of stuff going on. There's it's exciting. There's lots of opportunity for technological advancement. How, how do you, how do you help leaders, you know, do that so that it's appealing, even if it's an industry that may, may not be. Yeah, that, man, what a great question. And, you know, we, insurance definitely isn't going anywhere. We know that, right? right. There's, there's always going to be a need for that. But I think it's just in the way that, you know, that you tell the story about what you do, because, you know, facts are great, but beliefs are changed through story. And really, you know, there's four reasons that people buy anything, you know, whether it's, you know, an idea, a, a car, or whatever. And it's usually for, you know, to improve you know, status, to improve their time somehow, to improve relationships or to improve their health. And, you know, if you're working in an industry, you know, that, uh, you know, you get to serve other people and your growth potential is potentially unlimited, right? Because it's a, a form of sales and, you know, that, that's exciting to certain people like me. If you, and that's, you know, like I've worked in a similar industry for a number of years. And that's why, because I love to help other people. I love to, you know, be able to create my own you know, salary. I love to really have the freedom that that brings. And it perfectly lined up with the life I live. And the reason that I got so excited about it was the CEO of the company I work for told such a great story. And, you know, she, she lived it too. And I wanted, I wanted what she had, just like my version of that. And so, you know, being really authentic as a leader and, you know, are you doing what you say, you know, you're doing and you, you know, true to your values and, you know, the right people will show up and the right people will go away. And I think that's, you know, how you play to the edges. Yeah. When I was leading uh, some claim organizations and we all know claims, insurance claims, it can be, it can be a battle. It can be a, a sludge. It can be uh, difficult on the day to day. Uh, you know, one thing I would always tell my team is at the end of the day, were you able to help? somebody yeah. were you able to you know help someone to get them the benefit that they that they're entitled to were you able to explain something to someone that they may have been confused on were you able to set someone's mind at ease because you let them know that you got this i'm going to take care of this for you right and i said if you did any of those things despite any of the aggravation or any of the other things that you may have dealt with today you made a difference. You made a positive impact. Focus on that. Come back tomorrow and let's do it again. Right. And so, yeah, to your point, the story is so critical. And I think that's it at all levels of, of any industry, any business is crafting that story. That's where the data comes in. You know, data is only numbers if you don't have a story behind it. So yeah, it's such a great point. Yeah. I think that word help is so good. You know, like everybody wants to help and right. you know, like, you don't, have to be in any specific position to help, you know, sometimes helping is just showing up and being present for people and being a human and, you know, showing up without judgment. And I you know, like, we're all created out of this infinite love. Right. And like, that's unconditional love. Not like I love, I love you if you show up this way. Right. Right. Like that's, that's attachment. That's not love. Yeah. Wow. This has been a really good conversation, Kevin. If there's anything that you'd like my listeners, our list, the listeners of this podcast episode to walk away with after our conversation, what, what would it be? I think just be gentle, you know, be gentle with yourself, be gentle with the people that you interact with. You know, we're all in this thing together. We're all doing the best we can. And, you know, we're all basically in the middle of life in some form and everything looks kind of like a failure and messy in the middle. So be gentle with yourself and, you know, just if you're not getting the results you want, don't sweat it. Just do better next time. No big deal. Yeah. Well said. Yeah, so if anyone on this, on the podcast wants to uh, reach out to you or learn more about you is, is, is the Kevin Keppel.us website. Is that the best place for them to go? Yeah. Or LinkedIn or Instagram. Okay. It's Kevin Keppel everywhere. So wherever right. you'd like to go. 
Sounds good. I'll make sure to connect with you on LinkedIn. We'll, we'll stay connected as well. I'll put the website in the show notes. Uh, so all the listeners will have the opportunity to go there as well. So appreciate your time, Kevin. This was a great conversation. Uh, thank you very much for the time. Appreciate it. Thank you for joining us on our journey to learn about various topics. If you'd like to get in touch with the dad who knows nothing, connect with him at the dad who knows nothing on TikTok and Instagram or dad knows zero on Twitter. If you have a moment and you like this episode, drop us a review wherever you listen to your podcasts. Have a great day and enjoy your journey through this game called life.